We're uh, heading back to our series on the book of Hebrews. In December, we had a, a, a brief mini-series on stewardship, and then there was Christmas, and we enjoyed Christmas, and then our Spiritual Growth Covenant series in January, which we just finished up, and uh, all of those are extremely important, and, uh, and I'm glad that we had that opportunity. And uh, so let me ask you again, did you, first of all, going back to the stewardship series, did you fill out a faith pledge? I hope that you did. If you didn't have that opportunity, there's some uh, blank sheets out in the, uh, on the table across from the main doors. You'll see that. There's a little box for that. And like I mentioned a minute ago, did you fill out your spiritual growth uh, card from last week? If you were here last week, you received one. If you weren't here last week. Uh, there's one for you out, at, out on the same table. You'll see that and a little box to put those in. So you, you may have one with you that you've signed, put it in the box. You may need one. Maybe you lost that one. Sign it, put it in the box. And uh, what we'll do is we'll get back to you. Um, and it'll be laminated like this one. And, uh, and you'll find it in the mailbox that's out in the foyer. In fact, all of you and many of you did sign cards last week and put them in there, you'll find yours in there in envelopes with your name on them today. So would you please go get it and uh, take it home with you and uh, use it as a reminder of these uh, great commitments to be uh, true worshipers, to be involved in small groups, uh, committed to serving and uh, having a fruitful ministry to God uh, and, uh, and a regular commitment of giving to God. These are some of the and fundamental habits that really help us to grow. So I want to encourage you to do that. Okay, also, second chair, and remind me, there's still a lot of mail in those boxes from Christmas, so Christmas cards and such, so when you're back there, search through for your name for other envelopes as well, because you probably have some others there too. Okay, we're, we're, our theme in 2011 is moving forward by faith. Okay, and that theme has come out of this journey through the book of Hebrews. What a great book this is. I mean, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And, it, and uh, it, if you have, have any remembrance, you'll remember how important this book is to teach us and instruct us about living by faith. Okay, and so that's our theme for 2011. And what I want to do as we get started today is kind of take two steps back and one step forward and just uh, go back and kind of reintroduce you to the section of the book that we're in, because it will make a lot more sense for all of us, and especially for those who are kind of joining in at this point. Uh, if you're in chapter 12, the key verse that really the rest of the book is uh, keyed off of is the first two verses that Walter just read, and I want to read them to you again. Uh, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and you remember that that reference to the great cloud of witnesses is, is referencing back to chapter 11, which came before this, when it was a whole chapter of a list of Old Testament uh, uh, people who trusted God, and, uh, and they lived by faith. And uh, so that's what he's saying, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud, he's saying that today, you and I, as we live our lives, these heroes of faith are looking down, so to speak watching us run the same kind of race that they ran. This race for, for finishing by faith. And God wants us to finish by faith. So that's the point. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Our race. How do we do that? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith for the joy set before him endured the cross, scoring and shame and sat down the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, there, there's a, a lot in there, but I'm not going to go through it all again. But I just want to remind you that in chapter 11, these Old Testament heroes of faith, there were kind of two kinds. Okay, There were those who trusted God, and God did all sorts of amazing things through them. You know, as a result of their faith. Uh, the Red Sea was split, and so many other things, Moses and Abraham and so forth. But there was another whole group that, you know, it wasn't their ex, in fact, for none of them, it's not their exploits or their physical prowess or anything else 
But it's their trust in God that mattered. Because there was another whole group um, who were commended for their faith in God, who um, all they could do was to trust God through amazing difficulties. Okay, they endured great suffering and tragedy, but they trusted God through it. And the thing is, both groups equally were commended for their faith. So faith isn't about what happens or how great the, the circumstances are or the outcome is. Faith is about trusting God in anything and everything. And that's the race of faith that Hebrews is calling us to. And thus Hebrews 12 begins by saying, like them, you and I are to strip off everything that could get away, right? And let the race of faith. And so, uh, in November, I think it was, I encourage you to set aside a time. We talked about uh, a time to consider the weights and the sins that may be in our lives and that, that we would plan our 2011 run with Jesus. Do you remember that? I encourage you to do that. And, and some of you did that, I know. Probably a lot more than I know about. But I asked you to get back to me and tell me how that went. And I received a number of emails or, and, and some personal notes uh, after that. And I just want to read a few of those. As uh, I, What I asked you to do was take verses 1 and 2 seriously and consider the, the weights, the encumbrances in our lives that may prevent us from from moving forward in faith and sins that we know uh, are the ones that we struggle with and let God kind of throw the, the searchlight on our lives to discover those. And then I ask you to reread the book of Hebrews to be encouraged. So I just want to read, I, I, I made some excerpts from different emails. I just want to read a few of them before we go on. Here's one. It said, just finished my quote-unquote run. Haven't spent I haven't spent such an amount of time at once in the scriptures for a long, long time. It felt really good. May the Lord fill my heart with his grace and change things. There's one. Uh, another one. I set aside last Saturday morning and sort of followed the guide that Pastor Jose made. It was helpful to write out the things that are getting in my way of a deeper relationship with Jesus. I read through Hebrews with those things in mind and felt convicted to give up some things. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I know it can be done. I also just felt loved, encouraged, and strengthened to continue my walk with Him. Here's another one. I'm not going to tell you who these are. That's not that important. It starts off, hi there, like that. I completed the time to sit with my Bible and the Lord and a pad of paper. I have to say I felt very raw and bleeding after the detailing of my sins and weights that keep me from God. But then, reading Hebrews again, the image came back up. I am so thankful God included the words in Hebrews in his word. I felt so overwhelmed before reading it, thinking I could never get through some of the mountains I needed to climb. And then reading Hebrews again, I realized the mountains are not so overwhelming or unapproachable because of Jesus and God's grace. I feel energized and blessed. Thanks for encouraging us to spend time with God and His Word. One more. I'm just emailing you as you wished, to, wished us to let you know that I have completed my 2011 Run with Jesus homework you assigned. Please put on your prayer list that the Re Please put on your prayer list that the revelations brought forth with this will be constantly on the forefront of my memory. So I'm praying for all these folks and others. I didn't read all of them, but um, I think God is working. And it's 2011, and may He help us to run that race. Okay. Now, with that background, that brings us to chapter 12. I want us to see how the rest of chapter 12, and really the rest of the, the book of Hebrews, kind of fits into all of this. This idea of fixing our eyes on Jesus and running the race of our lives by faith is so important. It's really, it's really what it's all about, isn't it? It's so important that this writer knows, he knows that the devil is going to certainly try to place obstacles, big obstacles in our lives so that we won't accomplish that. Many different kinds of obstacles. 
to seek to trip us off and move us off the, the racetrack and get us sidetracked so that we won't finish the race. Okay? If you notice in chapter 12, verse 12, which is basically where we're picking up from our two-month hiatus, that he still has running metaphors in his language as he's encouraging us here. He says, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Okay. In verses 4 through 11, which precede that, and we've looked at this before, he warns us of a major obstacle. Remember, what I'm saying here is that Starting in chapter 12, verse 4, and going almost to the end of the book, the, the writer is going to list, and he's going to challenge us with all these obstacles that we need to either get over or avoid so that we can run the race and make it to the end. Okay? Um, it, it's kind of a different section in the book. If you've been following the book of Hebrews, most of it is very doctrinal, and it's teaching us about Jesus Christ and who he is, the great high priest. It doesn't have a lot of commands. You know, it has a lot of uh, information that we really need to know as his followers because it will encourage us. But then we get to chapter 12, and it's all about commands. It's all about imperatives. And they're imperatives that are, he's saying, look, I want you to run the race. I want you to make it to the end. But I want you to know there's obstacles that the devil's going to throw in your way. You need to avoid them. So the first one, in fact, the one he in, in some ways spends the most time with, we looked at last time. He says, look, there's going to be an obstacle that is so big that the devil's so good at using this in our lives, I need to talk about it. And it's the landmine of problems and difficulties. In this section, and if you remember, I said that it's the Bible teaches us it's the design of our loving Heavenly Father that through the hostility of sinful adversaries and the natural hazards of a fallen world, that God will allow suffering in our lives for a purpose. And a lot of people don't like to believe that. But that's how God works. He will allow suffering, difficulties, trials into our lives for a purpose. God doesn't always give us the reasons behind them either. But he does explain, as he explained in this passage, that he's treating us as any good parent would treat his son or daughter. It's an act of love. God is disciplining us. And as it says in this passage, I quote, For our good, that we may share in his holiness. Satan will try to get us to stop trusting God when these things happen. And uh, he wants us to cave in and say something like this. Say, God, if you're going to treat me like that, I try to be faithful to you. If you're going to treat me like this or someone in my family, you're going to let this happen. Then you can't love me like you say you do. And I'm not going to love you. And that's a big, big stumbling block. That's a big obstacle. And that's why in this passage he assures over and over again. Let me just quote some of the things. I know we didn't read this section. But in this passage it says, God disciplines those he loves. And it also says, God is treating you as sons. And it also says, God disciplines us for our good that we might share in His holiness. You know, just as a little child, many of you have had little children, or you have little children, and we all were little children, right? Just as a little child must learn to trust his mom and dad, even when they don't see the reason for it, so we must be willing to do likewise with our Heavenly Father, who has so much more wisdom and power in life than any earthly parent could ever have. Listen, bottom line, if you are not willing to trust God, if your spouse, for example, should prematurely die of cancer, or one of your children gets hit by a bus, or any other tragedy that, that could befall you as being a member of this human race, if you are not willing to trust God through that, then you're not going to run the race. 
to the finish line. That's the bottom line, and I'm not going to share it with that. That's true. So he brings that one up first. It's very important. But that brings us to the end of verse 12. And verse 12 is another encouragement to keep running. And then starting in verse 13, and almost to the end of the book, like I said, the author begins to exhort us to do and not to do certain things because they're also going to become obstacles to that life of faith. I just want you to see that real quickly this morning. We're not going to go into it, but I just want you to see how this book is laid out. So let me just uh, alert you. Follow me through. I hope you have your Bible in your hand. Look at verse 14. We'll just start with 12, 14. Notice the commands. Make every effort to live in peace of all men and to be holy. Look at verse 15. See to it, there's another command, that no one misses the grace of God. Verse 16. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless. They, it seems like almost random things, but they're not really random in this author's eyes because he says every one of these is like an obstacle. This is an obstacle race that we need to get around these things. See to it that no one is sexually immoral. And then look at, we'll go down to verse 28. Um, let us, it says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, here's another command, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. There's another one. Look at chapter 13, another command. Keep on loving one another as brothers. Verse 2, do not forget to entertain strangers. Verse 3, remember those in prison. Verse 4, the marriage bed should be honored by all, and marriage kept pure. Verse 5, it's just it's like bullets, one after the other. Keep yourselves free from the love of money, be content with what you have. Verse 7, remember your leaders. Verse 8, do not be carried away by all sorts of strange teachings. And we go on and on and on and on until we finally get to the end of the book. And, and he brings this to a summary. You see, the author sees the race to finish with faith, by faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting God through everything as like an obstacle course. He says there's a lot of things that are going to get to work. And you need to be aware. And you need to make some decisions. So for the rest of this morning, I would just like to pick up on the things that are mentioned in just verse 14. I want to be kind of see the overall picture and see what the first two obstacles in this list are. So look at it with me. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. He makes two admonitions to us. The first one is. But he starts with this, in, in the NIV it says, make every effort in. Some of your translations uses the word pursue. It's a very strong word, okay? It's stronger than the idea of seeking something. It's, it draws attention with intensity and urgency that you and I in, in God's church need to pay attention to this and seek it. Pursue it. Make every effort to be one. Number one, to be at peace with everyone. Number two, to seek holiness in our lives. Let's just talk about those two for just a few minutes. Be at peace with everyone. What is he saying here? Remember the context. He's saying that it will trip you up. It will trip me up. It will trip any Christian up in their spiritual journey if we choose to remain at discord with others. It will trip us up. I don't know if you believe that or not. You say, well, that seems like a petty one to start with, but you know, I don't think it is as a pastor. I've been here for 16 years now, and I've watched, I've watched Christians come into this church and leave this church, get involved in the ministry, and get uninvolved in the ministry. You know why? Because they, they can't get along with something. Because they haven't pursued peace. Because there's discord. Not because they don't... I don't think it's because they don't 
really want to serve God, but they've got their priorities wrong. And so they, in serving God, they came up against someone else, and maybe that someone else said something that they didn't like or was hurtful, and they bailed. But they didn't just bail on that person, they bailed on serving God. That's sad. So I think there's a reason why this one's here. Let us pursue peace with everyone because it will trip up our spiritual journey if we choose to be a discipline with others. Well, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that teaches the same thing. Jesus said it like this in Mark 9, 50. He said, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be, be made salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Romans 12, 18 puts it like this. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In other words, I think the Bible is very realistic. It says, you know, it's really not easy sometimes to be at peace with everyone. And it's saying, as far as it depends on you. In other words, do your part even if the other person refuses to do their part. That's all we, we need to do is be concerned about our response, not the other person's response. I grew up in the, anyone remember the 70s? <laughs> 70s, right? Peace was a big word back then. Remember? Uh, we had our own peace sign. We went around our church, you know, had our own peace sign. Peace, peace, you know. It meant something a little different back then, but, but there was something about that. I remember being part of that era. Is there was this sense that you know you could be with someone and you could have a discussion and they may say something totally different than what you believed. You know, maybe they even said something that was a little bit grating about you, and you could respond back then and say, "That's cool," <laughs> you know, or whatever, you know, and you kind of handled. You know, disparaging comments or or things that you didn't quite agree with. You handled them with a, a or at least the, the culture kind of put that on you that you just let it go. Say like, whatever. You know, peace, brother, peace. You know. Now maybe that was because half the people were like stoned out of their minds. <laughs> but but I know I wasn't. Rubbed off on me as well as there was a there was a sense where you know you kind of let other people believe what they wanted to believe even if you didn't believe it and it didn't make you get all upset. Well, there's a biblical dimension to that, and we need to be able to do that not for the same reasons, but we need to remember that as Christians we don't follow other people. We follow and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also need to remember that the church is, as someone put it, it's a hospital for sinners, not a hotel for saints. Right? I mean, we're all saints if we know the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're imperfect saints. We're sinners. And so you need to expect, and I need to expect, that if we serve God together, that we are going to, at times, rub shoulders with someone that doesn't agree with the, our philosophy or doesn't really do things the way we do it or may say something that's insensitive because, you know, they're sinners too. And we all do things we shouldn't do. And we will not serve God for the long haul. We will not run the marathon and get to the end uh, serving the Lord unless our focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so that we can really do what it says here. Make every effort to live at peace with all men. Part of that is because we have placed the priorities right in our lives. Okay. And it's not about us. It's not about us getting our way. It's about serving God. So that's the first thing I'd just like to say. I'd like to focus a little bit more on the second one. It says this. And be holy. And then it says something even stronger. It says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, holiness, we can get into a whole theological term. 
thing about the term holiness, but just bottom line, holiness is a word that represents living a lifestyle that is pleasing to the Lord. Because it's in conformity to the Word of God. Not perfectly, but it's, a, it's choosing to try to do that with our lives. Sin is avoided, but when sin happens in holiness, then sin is confessed promptly and it's turned from. Our actions are, we attempt to make our actions in our lives, whatever we do with it, whether it be in our relationships with people or in other things, work, um, uh, the way we work, our actions are Christ led and Christ honored. That's, I think that's a good summary of what holiness is. That's what he's talking about here. Seek holiness. Now I think you can say that clearly. An unholy lifestyle, which would be the opposite of what he's saying, would certainly be a major obstacle to running the life of faith, wouldn't it? Because how could you trust God? How could you say, I'm going to depend on God and then ignore what his word says and do what you want to do and not what the word says, you know, have relationships that are impure and unholy, you know, conduct your business, work for someone in a way that wouldn't honor Christ. Certainly, if you live an unholy lifestyle, you're not going to live a life of faith. But did you notice something else here? It says, without holiness, you won't even see the Lord. And this raises a more difficult thing I'd like to talk about. Because what that really is saying is without holiness, there's no salvation. Because you're not going to be with Jesus. So some of you may be thinking, well, Pastor, I thought eternal life was a free gift. You know, I thought eternal life was not something we earn. It's not the result of our actions, but of Christ's action for us on the cross that we apprehend by faith. And I would say to you, that's exactly right. And then you might say, but, but here, it says right here that, that without holiness, without living in conformity to his word, that I'm not going to see the Lord. How can that be? Can that be right? Well, I think that's right too. So then you say, well, how can that be? You know, isn't that a contradiction? On one hand, we're saved, we're made right with God because of our faith in Jesus and nothing else. And then here it says, unless there's holiness that goes along with that, we're not going to see him. It sounds like a contradiction, perhaps, but it's not one. Not at all. In fact, we've been seeing this teaching throughout the book of Hebrews in different forms and ways. You see, on one hand, this book, the whole Bible, and particularly the book of Hebrews, clearly teaches that it's solely through faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us on our behalf that we're saved and saved forever. For example, I'll just bring up a couple of verses we've covered. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he, meaning Jesus, is able to save completely, and that word completely means fully, and it means forever, both, those who come to God through faith. Hebrews 7.27, He, Jesus, sacrificed for their sins once for all, when he offered himself. Hebrews 10.14, because by one sacrifice, Jesus has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Okay, but on the other hand, as we've been reading this book, this book has taught with many kind of conditional statements saying that unless we persevere in faith, unless we persevere in the actions that God expects of us, that we are not going to see the Lord. In other words, we're not saved. For example, let me just remind you of a couple. Hebrews 3, 6 says, And we are his house if, there's that conditional statement, if we hold on to our courage and the hope of that which we boast. Hebrews 3, 14. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence of the faith that we had at first. Hebrews 6, 7, and 8. And this was a, a kind of a, a metaphor, but you can see what it's trying to get at. He says, the land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But the land that produces thorns and thistles 
is worthless. In other words, he says, this is an analogy, he says that, you know, the life that takes in what God has given and produces fruit is wonderful. But the life that receives the same rain but just produces junk, crap, thorns, thistles, sin is worthless. And then it says this, and is in danger of being cursed and in the end it will be burned. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27 put it this way. If we deliberately keep on sinning, which is no holiness, right? If we deliberately keep on sinning, that's the opposite of holiness. After we have received the knowledge of the truth, when one uh, then no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. These are strong verses. What's going on here? How can they both be true? Let me explain it to you like this. I thought about a way to explain it. Let's suppose you were going to be the contestant on a television game show. Okay? And in this game show, here's how it worked. At the game show, uh, when you first got there, you were immediately giving a, given a gift of $20,000 right up front. And then, the way this game show, this contest worked, in order to continue, in order to play the game show, it costs you $10,000 up front that you have to give them. So, actually, they just gave you $20,000, so you give them $10,000, and then you qualify to play. Now, I don't know if there's any game shows quite like that, but we make it this up. You get the idea. The money required to play the show, to play the game, was part of the gift that was initially given to you by the show. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that, in one sense, that is like our salvation that we receive from God. Okay? Our salvation is a gift from God, isn't it? When we put our faith in Christ. But that salvation includes everything that God will ever demand from us as well. Yes, salvation includes forgiveness. We talk about that a lot. Salvation includes His promise to be with us daily. Praise the Lord for that. It includes us being with Him forever in heaven someday. That's all true. But it also includes faith and righteousness and holiness and love and yes, even peace, which we talked about first. They're all included in our salvation gift as well. That's why salvation can both be a free gift, which it is, and at the same time, the scripture can say, without holiness, no one will ever see the Lord, because in salvation, God gives us the gift of holiness, the desire to be like Him, the desire to grow like Him. Did you notice that? We read it already in a couple verses I quoted. Look back at chapter 10, verse 14. When I was confirmed by God's one sacrifice, we're saved forever. But notice what it says. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever who? Those who are being made holy. He's making the ones that he sacrificed for, the one that he laid down his life for, and he died for us. He gave us that sacrifice, and the ones who receive it are those who are being made holy by him. So within the salvation that he gave, gives us is the holiness element that we need, that he looks for in us. And Ephesians 2 8 9 talks about faith the same way. You know that, you know, it's by faith that we're saved, right? But even that's a gift from God, right? It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith alone. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works that no one can both see. Faith is a gift. And therefore, keeping your faith or confidence in God to the end, as Hebrews admonishes, is something that comes with the gift of faith. Holiness is a gift. Therefore, those who do not demonstrate a true desire to please God in their lives, those who may mouth, I believe in Jesus, I'm a Christian, but willfully ignore the commands of God, they, in fact, demonstrate that they never received the gift to, the, the, you know, to start with. Because 
holiness is part of the gift. Hebrews 2 11 puts it like this Both the one who makes men holy, that's Jesus, and those who are being made holy are of the same family. The only people in Jesus' family are those that he's making holy. And if you're saying that, if, if anyone says, I'm a Christian, and yet they live as if they're not a Christian, if they live as if it didn't matter, they, they make their own choices, they don't follow what the scripture says about living a Christian life, then they're not in the same family, Jesus said. Because the one who makes men holy and those who are being made holy are the ones who are in the same family. And then it says, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. That's who the people of God are. So, in the end, there's really no contradiction. Because when God saved me, and when God saved you and Jesus, gloriously, He implanted in us the persevering faith to trust Him through thick and thin forever. He implanted in us a desire to demonstrate peace in our relationships with others. He implanted in us a desire to live in a way that will be pleasing to Him. That's holiness. And so, if you look at your life and you claim to be a Christian, and yet there's no holiness in your life, no real desire to please God. No real desire to follow His ways in your life. Realize this. The Bible is very clear. The Bible can give you no assurance. No assurance that you truly are a Christian. In fact, the Bible says, what it says is this, and it's our passage for today, you will not see the Lord. Next week, we're going to encounter an even more sobering warning about that based on what we're looking at and talking about right now. It says that if we continue to reject Christ and play like a superficial Christian game, then we can come, people can come to a point where, like Esau, he's the example, it becomes impossible for that person to repent and be saved. We cross the line and say, it's not that God won't save us if we repent, but we can't repent anymore. So he says, see with that no one misses the grace of God. So I have to ask you that this morning. Are you missing the grace of God? Do you, when you look at your life, do you see a desire to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about perfection because none of us have that. None of us. Scripture makes that very clear. But is there desire? Is there movement in your life? Say, I am willing. I want to do it. With God's help, I need His strength. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be a person that loves God and worships Him. I want to be a person that serves God. I want to be a person that grows in my spiritual relationship with God. If you are, then I hope you'll be greatly encouraged today. But if you can't see those things, and they don't even matter to you or are meaningful to you, then do not be assured. Don't hold on to false assurance. I prayed this prayer once, you know, I made a one-time faith commitment to Jesus Christ. You know, there's no such thing as a one-time faith commitment to Jesus Christ. There's a first-time faith commitment to Jesus Christ, but it's not a one-time faith commitment. It's an ongoing faith that continues and grows and is part of your life. And if it was just a one-time, one moment, I said something to Jesus and that was it, then that's not it. That's not what the Bible teaches. Come to Jesus Christ. Make the first time true faith commitment to Jesus Christ. Christ that goes on and grows and deepens. And then for us who have done that, this is a reminder, I hope, for all of us that we are in a race, aren't we? But it's an obstacle course kind of race in many ways. And if we're going to get to the finish line, we have to avoid the obstacles. 
So I hope you'll take these instructions from God today seriously to pursue peace with all that and to seek to be holy for God is holy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to um, apply this passage to our lives wherever it fits. And God, I know many people, most everyone in this room, and yet I don't know anyone's heart, but I believe most really do have a great desire to be pleasing to you. Lord, would you help us to pursue peace with all men? And Lord, if there's some particular areas that this is not happening, that we have shut the door to you working in that area of our life, Lord, would you help us? And by your power, Lord, would you help us to bring resolution there? Because God, it is affecting our spiritual journey. You've told us that. If for no other reason, God, help us to truly pursue and make peace. And Father, would you help us to seek to be holy? Lord, not holy than thou, but God, to have a desire to live life that's pleasing you. Thank you, Father. Be with us as we close. Remind us of these words. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.